Everyone is either lost or found. Everyone is living for self or for Jesus. Everyone is either trending toward a fatal or a faithful end. Lost. Lost is an idea that's been mostly lost. I don't say that to be clever, but we sang today, you know, about being saved. The Lord is powerful to save. But sometimes when we look at people or we talk to people, we have this good news. But if people don't realize they're lost, they're not quite that excited about being found. So today we have the title. Notice the title of this message, Lost, Found, Fishing, Finishing. And you know, a lot of us forget that we've been lost and we don't remember what it's like to have that experience. Sometimes we zoom straight to the uh, found and finishing. We're going to, we're going to let the Lord change us and, and, and we're going to get the spiritual upgrades. He's going to change us. And that's, that's right on. But you know what? we got to remember what it's like to be lost. We need to know what it means to be found. And when, then before the finishing, uh, the, the last three Fs, they go together, right? Lost, found, fishing, and finishing. I think a lot of us think that we're going to finish without fishing. And I want to say to you that this year, praise the Lord, I think he's leading us. I think he's going to show us that this is going to be a good year for us for fishing, evangelism. Lost is an idea that's been mostly lost. If someone is lost, I should help them be found. The idea that another may be lost reminds me that as a Christian, I am a servant of Jesus who gave himself. Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We are either lost or we've come to Jesus and we have present salvation. We're fishing for men with Jesus and we're finishing. We're seeking Jesus' internal work of sanctification, but we are not going to finish well if we're not fishing as we're finishing. Fishing ought to be our burning desire. It matters. People are lost. Let's turn to Matthew 18. Matthew shares Jesus' approach to the lost. Matthew 18, verses 10 to 14. Now looking into the word of God. Matthew 18, verses 10 to 14. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over the sheep, that sheep, than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, if you read the part that comes before this, this all began with the disciples arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's how this exchange happens that uh, Jesus, we just read through here. And so they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
And Jesus takes a small child that's nearby and he puts him in the middle. This is going to be an illustration. He tells them they must become trusting like small children. He even tells them, and maybe this kind of has escaped us, it's kind of intense. He even tells them that if they do not become in this respect like small children, they will not be in heaven. Now, when Jesus tells us something about if this isn't in order, you will not be in heaven. Isn't he saying that they'd be lost? Isn't that kind of significant when Jesus talks that way? Jesus continues by saying that anyone who causes a small child who believes in him to sin, he says it would be better for their life to be ended for them than for them to do that. That sounds very serious. Now, every Christian has an accompanying angel. In Hebrews 1, verse 14, we read about their mission. What is the mission of the angels? They're called ministering spirits. Uh, Ministering for what? Well, they're sent forth, it says... They are sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. So who would that be? God provides the angels to help us. You know, sometimes people go out and they pay a large sum to have a very, an exact certain breed of a certain kind of an animal, a pet. God has provided these intelligent angel beings, not as our pets, but as our helpers and guides, so that we can be effective fishermen, fishing among men. These angels stand ready to help us speak with each other words of spiritual encouragement. They are also ready to unite with us so that we might speak to others and have a supernatural effect I've read this before, and I'll probably read it again. But I'm going to read it again right now. Listen to this. Desire of Ages 297. This is, this is so significant. We are to be laborers together with the heavenly angels. With who? Heavenly angels. In presenting Jesus to the world with almost impatient eagerness. The angels wait for our cooperation. They're ready. How many times have you gone into the store and you get out of your car and you just check your pockets? And, oh, I don't, have, I don't have any tracks right now. You've got a rack of tracks out there. Here's a tract on a better future. I'm going to take it home and read it. You know, handing these off. Not very painful. It should be a joy. And the church is provided. These have been ordered up for you by our different officers, and we've got them here, and on your way out, grab a handful of tracts. And no harm will come to you if you give out a tract. We're in a world where there's so little hope, there's so much despair loneliness and depression they're 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 higher than they've ever been people just don't there's a lack of meaning you know people get real excited when a new product comes out years ago they started lining up when a new phone would come out that's weird let's just say it that's kind of weird that's really kind of strange but people have their hope in the wrong stuff. You know what? I didn't finish reading the quote. Here's the quote again. We are to be laborers together with the heavenly angels in presenting Jesus to the world. With almost impatient eagerness, the angels wait for our cooperation. For man must be the channel to communicate with man. And when we give ourselves to Christ in wholehearted devotion... Angels rejoice that they may speak through our voices to reveal 
God's love. Angels speaking through your voice. That's, that's pretty awesome. And I do not doubt that every one of us, every one of us here, at some time, at some point in your experience, you shared a good, a good word toward heaven, and your guardian angel perhaps spoke through your lips as you cooperated with heaven, and someone was given a piece of hope in the dark world. The angels are so ready, but God calls us to do the speaking, and there's the most important condition here, giving ourselves to Christ in wholehearted devotion, and I fear that sometimes we have devotion to God. It's not always a wholehearted devotion, though. It's a half-hearted or a semi-hearted semi devotion. But when we do it, when we are wholeheartedly devoted to the, the king, that causes joy among the angels because that's when they are especially empowered to speak through our voices to reveal God's love. Speak into the world. The world needs saving. The world is lost. And that means that individual persons need saving. Every single one of them. People used to be concerned that a neighbor might be going to a Christless grave. But such concerns almost seem quaint today. After all, this is the way we think about it. This is the way we rationalize. After all, isn't God big enough to win people without our help? He doesn't need us. Why should I tell my neighbor or a stranger about my beliefs? God has other agents. If God wants to save that person, they can hear Doug Batchelor, Mark Finley, John Bradshaw. So, okay, I admit to you, God has other agents. But don't forget that you, too, are his agent. This word lost underneath it, it's quite interesting in your Bible, this word lost, it has the meaning uh, of being destroyed, something which is essentially destroyed. In essence, it's already destroyed. Those that are, have not given their heart to Jesus, they are, they are ready to be finally destroyed, but they're living a life which is uh, not a fruitful life. It's a life with destruction in it. Life, that's what they need. They need Jesus. The lost person doesn't have salvation. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, and it's the first part to me that's the most interesting there, that he came that we might have life that we might have life. The life that many have isn't life. Can we say that? Life without Jesus is not life. Is a fish that never swims alive? Does a flying bird that never experiences flight, that gift of uniqueness that God gives it, is that bird fully, fully actualized? I'm not sure what we would call it. Is a human being who's designed for holiness and community, who remains separated from Jesus and holiness, is that, is that person fully human if he knows nothing of holiness? Have you heard about some of these young people today in their teens or even in their 20s who have died playing video games? They play intensely. They play in groups over the Internet. They have these big competitions. And every now and then, you'll, there's, this is happening. They're the last breath, and they're meeting eternity. And they were just playing a video game. Dead. That's not life. Wherever you are, you are the agent of Jesus. You are an ambassador for the king. But perhaps we see ourselves as oh, just one ambassador among many. Uh, there's, there's the four of us here, and you know, 
these, these people talk better than I do. I think I'll just be quiet and let them do the talking. But maybe, you know, we see ourselves as that one, one ambassador among many, but you should revisit that because so often the many are not there, but sometimes you are there. And that makes you the ambassador of the king. If you're the only one, then you're the ambassador of the king. Would Jesus pass you by? How can we so easily pass others by? You know, one of these famous, uh, famous performer, I think his name is Penn. I think he's an, a, a well-known atheist. And after his, one of his shows, some, a Christian came up and began to try to tell him about Jesus. And this guy's a well-known atheist. And he talked about this afterward that at another occasion. And he said something like this. <clears throat> I respect the people who try to tell me about their faith. I respect them. I don't agree with them. I don't think they're right. I don't think what they're saying to me is rational. But he said, how much must you hate somebody if you believe that by telling them this, this can help them towards salvation, and, inst and then you choose not to tell me? And he says, I respect these people who tell me and they give me Bibles and tracts. I respect them for that, and I don't understand the Christian who won't tell me about Jesus. He said, how much must you actually hate me not to tell me about what you, at least what you think you found? Interesting words. Interesting to me. Friend, if you were in the large department store shopping and someone ran into the building shouting, a, fire's on, a, a, a car's on fire in the parking lot. Now we all know what would happen, don't we? Many in the store would head for the exit, maybe not so much concerned that, that the burning car was their car, but because they want to make sure their car isn't parked next to that burning car. Right? There's a lot of self-serving things there. And yeah, I don't, want, I don't want the car next to mine to be burning either, do you? But a car, it's just a useful machine. It's made out of metal and plastic, and, and more plastic than it used to be. It has nothing godlike in it. It's not made in God's image. It has no option for eternity. It has no option for holiness or community or life or love. You may love your car, but it does not love you back. And yet many would value that machine in that moment more than valuing the potential loss of eternity because that person standing in line next to you might become a self-centered, violent, and corrupt being and choose to reject holiness and community for eternity. Most people are more concerned about their, their, little, their phone than they are that somebody standing next to them in line might be lost for eternity. Am I telling you the truth? Yes. Often the idea of lostness in Scripture is the idea of personal lostness. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9. Maybe you think, Pastor, the more you read the Gospels, maybe you get tired of them and you want to go to some other thing. You know what? The more I read the Gospels the more I want to read them more. I'm learning more and more. Let's go to Luke 9, 23 to 26. There are lessons for us. Okay, so this is Luke 9, starting at verse 23. Jesus is talking, and he says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, 
There are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Jesus warns us to count the cost. Do we desire to come after him? Do we desire to follow him? We say we do. We say it. But do we truly desire to be kind and gentle and as actually loving as Jesus is? We say it. Because if we do desire that, if we do carry it out in our actions, the world will hate us. If I don't talk about spiritual things, then I can keep the door open to talk to people someday about spiritual things. You might have to think about that one for a minute. You see how the devil gets you thinking? I won't talk about something important now so I can talk about it later. And then later, you do it again. And as we don't do it again. And then you don't do it again. And you don't do it again. And why are we making the devil so happy? If we carry out this love that God gives us by our actions, the world will hate us. So Jesus warns us to count the cost. I'm not so certain that we're willing to be hated by the world. I see indicators that, that many of God's people have such a feeble experience in Jesus that they're worried over being called names. They're worried over being canceled by Satan. Friend, there's no appeasing Satan or his captives in the world. You were only alive because God's, God has specially intervened. Satan is Apollyon. He is the destroyer. You cannot negotiate with him. He is malevolence incarnate. I saw an item on Twitter yesterday about a woman in Australia. A man had murdered her mother murdered her in cold blood. She pled for mercy, and eventually this man was released from prison. She worked it out for him to come and live in her home. And you probably already can figure out where this is going. After a short period of time, he murdered her as well. In spite of all of her compassion for him, he refused to be changed. There is something in the Bible called the, we call it the unpardonable sin. That is when someone has chosen to be like Satan, to be only a destroyer. And then it is folly to trust them. They're not safe and they never will be safe until heaven in mercy toward us and them ends them. There are people like that. And that's the way the devil is. That's the way the devils are. Hollywood sometimes makes a big thing about, you know, people negotiating with Satan. There's no negotiating with Satan. There's nothing you can negotiate with him. He's a liar. And even if he could give you something good for five minutes, what about the end when the five minutes is over? Remember, it's not our talk about God that Satan hates. Quite the contrary. He loves it when most of us talk about God. Do you understand why? He is well pleased when we speak of God and then render to the world a life inconsistent with God's holiness and love. And that stimulates kind of a crooked joy in the mind of the devil. Then our behavior creates another instance of hypocrisy in the world, and that serves his purposes very well. He is very pleased. When most Christians talk about God, the devil's face curls into a devil smile, and he says, I am going to have the, uh, the testimony of hypocrisy. And he just gets real joyful. I'm against happy devils. I want sad devils. Do we desire to follow Jesus? Because if we do, we must come after him. We'll have to climb up out of our familiar things, out of our ruts and habits, and out of our keeping to ourselves. 
Maybe we want to eat all the blueberries, but would Jesus eat all the blueberries? Jesus would share the blueberries. Jesus calls me to take up my cross daily. Share my blueberries. If he gave me the gospel, he tells me to share the gospel. Friends, there is no Christianity without self-denial. If I choose to refuse the call to self-denial, then I am choosing to keep my corrupt, self-serving values. I'm choosing to keep my old behaviors and to reject converted behaviors. If I instead choose to surrender those old, comfortable behaviors, and I lose my life for Jesus' sake, I actually save my life. I actually replace the dead life with the life life. In the Gospel of John, we hear about Judas, and we hear about his being personally lost. You know where we hear it? We hear it in Jesus' prayer in John 17. In John 17, verse 12, Jesus is praying, and he says, he says, he mentions that none of the disciples are personally lost, but Judas, Judas, the son of destruction, right? Perdition, he's the son of perdition, that means destruction. In Luke 18, 9... We find that Judas is personally lost, but he wasn't lost by Jesus. You see, Judas was lost because of his own choices. Jesus did everything possible to win Judas. He's lost anyway by his own decision to keep his old, broken nature, but Jesus did all he could. Jesus did all he could to save Judas. But you and I, we aren't even close to doing all that we could to save other people. I'm talking to me too. Are you doing all that you can so that other people can be saved? No, you're not. Friends, a question. Are we ashamed of Jesus in his words? We have the best words. We have the Bible. We have the best words. Other writings and ideas don't even have the remotest likeness to the gospel of God. We have the best words. But are we afraid someone might call us a name? Or have we subscribed to, or do we, are we afraid people will think we've subscribed to strange ideas? I'm not trying to beat us up today a little bit. I just want us to, to rethink and regroup and, and, and realize again that this part about lost, found, fishing, finishing... I don't think we're doing enough fishing. Hmm. And you see guys, these guys out on the ice? I haven't seen them yet. I don't know that the ice has been thick enough yet, but they're out ice fishing on the lakes, their little hut set up there, fishing all year round. I think there's a lesson for us there too. We need to fish all year round. Some Christians are ashamed of Jesus and his words. The only reason one would be ashamed is because one has not made them his own words. Not all kingdoms are created alike. Some civilizations are better and some worse than others. The Christian civilization is the civilization of kindness, gentleness, unselfishness, serving, givingness, mercy, forgiveness, transformation. It's the one civilization that's true represents true humanity. Do you know that by experience? Jesus tells a parable, Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. You know the parable. The owner, he has a vineyard, he hires these laborers, and out of the kindness of his heart, he knows people are hard up, and he sees some people loitering around the town square and there's not too much time left for all the labor that might be done that day. But he goes and he hires them too. And they come out and they work for a very brief period of time. You know the story. So then, it's time to pay because in the Bible, the Bible plan is you get paid at the end of the day. You get your wages at the end of the day. It's not the way things usually work in our world, but that's the Bible world. So the laborers who work the whole day... They get paid just what they were agreed to. And then last of all, these guys come in and work for hardly an hour. 
and they get a full day's wage. And you know the response. These other workers are that work the whole day and sweat it all day long, they're furious. And they begin to moan and complain, but the vineyard owner asks them if they're angry with him because he's good. Verse 15, Matthew 20, verse 15. Are you angry with me because I'm good? There are some lessons there for us. In the Old Testament, the prophet Jonah has a similar feeling. Jonah finally preaches. He's got a few side trips there, but gets, the Lord gets him into his place. And he goes and he preaches, and the Ninevites repent. And when they repent, Jonah is angry because God responds by not destroying them. God's mercy wasn't even echoed by his servant Jonah. And often God's mercy is not echoed by us because we're too busy to do our first work, connecting with hearts for Jesus. And I want to finish by looking with you at another story, a story about a lost man found. So let's turn over to Luke in chapter 19. By the way, this year we're going to get a lot of pieces, God willing. We're going to talk about all kinds of things, things that are simple, straightforward things you can do to talk to your friends, your family, your loved ones, people at work, people at the store, people in the wherever you are, you're waiting, you're getting a your car serviced, you could talk to people there. Have you ever seen at Myers? Yeah, at the store. Have you ever seen those benches that are near the front and there are people often just sitting on those benches waiting for their, their family or friends out there, they're shopping in there and they're waiting to be picked up. There's people waiting on the bench, they're just st- sitting there alone. And a lot of those are sometimes older people. They don't even have a cell phone out. That might be somebody out. You can give them a tractor. You could, best of all, if you can work your way into the right kind of a conversation with them. We're going to talk about things like that. We're going to talk about the two things that are always there for you, two proofs, indisputable proofs. Before you even open the Bible, two proofs about God that should stimulate some people to do some serious thinking. We're going to equip you with this kind of stuff this year. I know I took a lot of time off in uh, December, but I was working in all this stuff all that time, so it really wasn't time off. But that's okay. I'm not worried about that. I am am very happy the things that God is, is helping us with. Let's go over there to Luke 19, and let's read about a man who was lost start at verse 1 and go to verse 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with the man who was a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why in this message today, when I sat down to work on it, and I got that right away, you know, lost, found, fishing, finishing, I never got past lost. Because I think we forget about the lost thing. Let's talk about this thing here with Zacchaeus. No one else in the town liked Zacchaeus except maybe a few of his fellow tax collectors. 
An important guy, but he didn't have too many friends. He had defrauded people. You understand that. Now Zacchaeus turns over a new leaf, and likely soon it will be that most of his friends, his few friends that he actually had, they're not going to be his friend either. either. But instead of the people being glad, did you see their response? Instead of the people being glad, they, and I will use this word, they cherish their dislike for the tax collector. The complaint is universal. Did you see what it said in the text? And they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a, a sinner. So there it is again, God's goodness. They should be happy to see that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus and that Jesus wants to see Zacchaeus. But no, they all complained. And in their complaint, they show that they're no better than Zacchaeus. In his corrupt self, in his greed-oriented, self-serving character, he was, a, he was. He was a blight to the community. But so are they. They flock to hear Jesus. But when Jesus showed actual mercy to someone, they lost their minds. Look what Jesus said. After Zacchaeus makes his public admission and his fourfold restoration, now, by the way, you might re realize that the Torah, in Exodus 22, verse 4, do you remember what it says? When a thief is found with the stolen goods, how much does he restore? Double. Double. If you stole $1,000, you'd restore $2,000. Did you see what Zacchaeus said? He doubled the double. The people I've defrauded, I'm going to give them four full. I'll give them four. I stole a thousand. I'm going to give them four thousand. And the people refuse to accept Zacchaeus, and, and they turn now and they begin to complain about Jesus. Wish this guy was out of our town now. What is he still? Why is he still here? Get, he needs to get out of Jericho. Get, get, and take that sinner with him. That's the, that's what they're saying. They seem kind of fickle, don't they? But are we them? Sometimes. Do we care so little for the lost that we can't be troubled to make the effort, some effort to guide them towards the kingdom? Some effort, just some, some effort. Of Zacchaeus, Jesus said this, Today, salvation has come to this house, you know, to Zacchaeus' house and to the community of Jericho, because he, Zacchaeus, is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you want insight into the ministry, the life of Jesus, what made him go? This is it. He came to save us very problematic creatures. Jesus immediately received Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, a tax thief, a collaborator with the Roman occupation. Zacchaeus was valuable to Jesus. Jesus immediately accepted Zacchaeus as a son of Abraham. Jesus was enlarging the kingdom. Jesus was enlarging the family. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I want to conclude by reminding you that this is why you are in this place. Lost, found, fishing,
finishing. You were lost, I was lost. But now we're found. We are accepted in the beloved. Oh, but pastor, I, I don't feel accepted in the beloved. Well, you're accepted in the beloved. Jesus received us immediately. If you'd been the only person in that town and God had, Jesus had been there, he would, and he would, have, he would have received you immediately. He would have said of you, of your, and he would have said your name in there. Put the blank in your name. He said, now this person is a son of Abraham. But here's the thing. We may have forgotten that we were lost. And if we've forgotten we were lost, we may have forgotten that we were found. And if we're not looking for ways to speak with others about Jesus, then maybe 2023 should be different. So in this new year, we're going to work out some of the easy ways to talk to other people of God's things. Talk to them when we're in the store, when we're in the market, when we're in the park, when we're at a family gathering. But the first step, I think the first step, I think this is a, a, a forgotten piece. We need to remember where we came from. We were lost, and now we are found. But there are so many out there who are still lost. So we need to invest some time and prayer and effort into learning how to use the words of Jesus himself. How we can catch men. So this is going to be kind of, uh, I pray that you'll join me on a journey this year, a little bit of a journey, a fishing trip. <laughs>